Okay, next. Oh, that's one more. Okay, frozen. Yes. When you do your um, dual and triple sided readings, uh, do you mix the semen or do you no. do one, wait a day? Do I mix the semen right. when I do my multiple sided readings? I usually do one a day. Yeah, I usually do one of this. But I can tell you that when I do multiple sires, when I'm doing a frozen frozen insemination, I inject one horn with one dogs and the other horn with the other dogs. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter. I think I'm just making myself feel better because I end up with male puppies on one side that are from, or you know, puppies on both sides. <laughs> it all gets mixed up. Frozen, technique handled with care. Okay, this is liquid nitrogen. The thing that we're looking at right now is we're looking at a new thing that's called liquid helium that apparently stores better. And it's a little harder to handle, but if we can work with liquid helium, they're using it in Australia um, to freeze meat. And it works really, really well because it keeps the continuity of the cells better. So we're thinking about, uh, about changing over. Um, but you do have to handle it with care. You see that there's a glove on this hand, which is supposed to be glove, because you can burn your fingers really, really badly working with it. There are different types of storage tanks. There are central tanks. There are tanks um, like at ICB, um, International Canine Seaman Bank. Clone is another central bank. I have a separate bank um, that's been AKC approved. Um, my bank is under my control. I do everything by contract. If you have sperm in there, it's all con on contract. Um, and mine is, I have a backup. So if we have a hurricane and something happens, mine does not go down. We just recently had a problem with one of our really good friends where they did not have a backup. They had a horrible storm and they lost all the frozen sea in the hand. <coughs> so that wasn't really, really good. The life expectancy. When you when you thaw frozen sperm, and frozen sperm is also also wrapped up with that propylene glycol egg stuff. Okay, seems to be a good combination to, to protect it. Um, when you inseminate, and that's the reason that you really want to have an LH because you want to be so close to the perfect time for insemination. But if you're going to use um, if you're going to use frozen semen. 24 hours after the insemination is only is as long as the eggs live. Yes, that too. <laughs> it's as, that's as long as the sperm lives. So, and actually we have some sperm that only lives for 12 hours. So we have to worry about that. So that's one of the things that you have to worry about. That's why it is so critical when you are doing frozen semen that you make sure that you are timing, that your timing is proper. There are two ways that we do our inseminations with frozen semen. You can do them by transcervical inseminations, or you can do them by surgical implants. We do ours primarily by surgical implants, although I am going to show you a, a, um, a transcervical. Okay. We, we freeze with pellets. There are two different ways to freeze. We freeze with pellets. The reason we freeze with pellets is that pellets, you can take one pellet out and you can test it to make before you ship it to make sure that that pellet is healthy. And that way we can actually certify the pellets that we are shipping to the next, the next station. If you do it in straws, you have to use an entire straw. And two, two entire straws may be an insemination, whereas 10 pellets may be an insemination. So it's my feeling, even though I know how to do both, my feeling is that I prefer to do pellets because pellets work better for me. So. The cost, your collection. This is another big thing. It's very variable around the United States. Your initial collection can be anywhere from $250 to $500, and your shipment of frozen semen can be anywhere from $150 to $300. If you're shipping to Europe, you could be, you could be talking about five or $600. Okay, so the shipping is expensive, and the reason the shipping is so expensive is that you have to prepare a tank, you have to take the sperm out of the freezer, you have to evaluate the sperm, you have to put it in the new tank, and then you have to put it in a special container that has to be attached specially on the outside because it is liquid nitrogen. 
And then we always ship by FedEx. I mean, that's the only way we ship. We do not use anything but FedEx. And we no longer allow our clients to carry it with them. We, it's just not, it's not worth it. The other thing that you have to do is in order to get your shipment out there, you have to put a $1,000 um, deposit down on the tank. And the reason you have to put a $1,000 deposit down on the tank is, God forbid, something should happen to the tank. The tank's cost of about $1,000. So it's not an inexpensive ship, uh, thing to do with frozen semen. There aren't that many of us in the room, probably can count on me, one hand, that have done frozen semen successfully with collies. Um, yes? Pardon? I have done Mm -hmm. in Norway, and I'm from Sweden, so I don't from Norway. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's not allowed in Sweden. Yes, it is, but they're very Yeah, I have lost. I didn't think I it was allowed in Sweden. I thought I thought artificial insemination was not allowed in Sweden. Yes, it, uh, it was um, for two years. Oh, two years now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I went all the way over there to pick up a dog. <laughs> As long as it works, we don't worry about it, but, but you have to be exactly on time with your LHP and your progesterones to do your insemination and make sure that it's going to work because your frozen semen is only going to last in the bitch for about 12 to 24 hours, so you have to be really, really careful. And your shipments can, I mean, your, your costs can vary from there. You can go in and have your dog collected and the, and the sperm is no good. So you've gone in for a collection and it gets thrown on the floor. I will not freeze. I won't spend somebody's money unless the sperm is going is to be viable afterwards. So, you know, we, we have a pretty good understanding with our clients as far as that's concerned. Okay. Can you do a test for your clients Absolutely. Before Absolutely. Before it goes into the tank. Yeah. After we free, after, do we do a test freeze and thaw? After we freeze the semen, we take out one pellet and we thaw it and see what the viability is. That is actually how you get your true number of sperm because you consider your total number of live sperm after the thaw. Okay, so that's how you consider it. So, because a lot of dogs don't freeze. Yeah. Yeah. Any idea why? Well, I think that's where we're playing with the different with the different extenders. I think as long as we play with the different extenders, we're going to find something that, something that works. Okay. What are the requirements for frozen? You have to do DNA, of course, because any frozen litter has to be registered with DNA. Brucellosis. Um, if you were going to be shipping your sperm to Australia, I know it's Australia does it now. I, I know Sweden used to do it. Um, but if you're going to be shipping to Australia, you have to do lepto and brucellosis titers. And they have to be done prior, there's a certain period prior to freezing that it has to be done. If you don't do it, then the sperm will not get into the country. So it's both things, it's leptospirosis and brucellosis. The other thing that we have to have is we have to have two photos of the dog, one standing and one from the side. So we make sure that the dog that we have in there really is in there. One of the things that's not in there is um, that we need to be microchipped. We now need to be microchipped. And um, we have to be registered with the AKC. If you want to, let's say that you have some frozen sperm. And you have a friend that you want to sell some sperm to. Then what you can do is you can go ahead and sell that sperm. And they can just store it in the freezer. But that all has got to be registered with the American Kennel Club. If any sperm that goes from one place to the other, it has got to be registered with the American Kennel Club. So if you had semen shipped over, AKC found out about it. They know. Okay, let's see what Oh, artificial insemination. This is what I love to do too. Okay, this is um, trans cervical insemination. How many of you have seen this? All right. This is trans cervical insemination. This is a gold retriever bitch. I don't even know why we inseminate them. 
because you put the sperm on one side of the room and you're the dog on the other But this is what we have. This is, this is a, um, an endoscope, and we actually put it up into the dog's vagina, and you'll get to see a little video, into the dog's vagina, all the way up to the cervix that looks like a rotten egg. And if you just do your timing by vaginoscopy, you actually can time a bitch by va vaginoscopy. Because what happens is, originally it's nice and clean and pink, and then all of a sudden it gets long the, the folds get longitudinal lines, and then they get lines that go horizontally. And all the way at the end of, this, of, the, of the vaginal vault, you'll see this thing that looks like a rotten egg. And that's when the cervix is ready. And that's when the bitch is ready to be bred. And we get to see a rotten egg this morning. Okay. Artificial insemination. We're going to do one of those today. We've got Minitube has, has come out with these great tubes. We all know about this one, right? Yeah. Okay. This is a Mavic. The Mavic actually has a little port where you blow it up. Do you see it? Okay, and what this does is it holds it inside. Oops, let me blow it up again. <laughs> you're making your own tie. You're making your own tie. And so you make your you make your own tie in there. So and it keeps the bitch, it keeps her so she's going like this. You guys can get these too. Plus they're nice and rubbery and they work really well. Mavic. M-A-V-I-C. And for a collie, you want a medium size. And um, I think they're like thirty-five dollars a piece. Is that a medium? That's a medium. Yeah, that's a medium. If I had brought you large, it wouldn't fit in my suitcase. <laughs> really? Oh, we have some really big ones. <laughs> Remember, it's it's all those huge dogs. Mm. So anyway, that's what we use now because it does simulate a tie. And it keeps that bitch's vagina going like this. You know how we used to feather? Mm -hmm. We don't even have to feather. You don't even have, even have to keep them on the head anymore. You can just, I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to do, we are actually going to do a Mavic on, on Orly today, so you get to see her. She means so good. <coughs> so that's our, well, well, how we do artificial insemination. Transcervical insemination. We put the endoscope all the way into the bitch. This is what we see on the scope. <coughs> we have a little TV. We usually have the, the owner in with us. The owner usually comes in with us because they love to see pictures and we like, we like them to watch. And then we have this big tube right here. See this tube? You see that? That's where we actually inject the sperm. So we take our scope and we go up and we look through the cervix. And then we take this little tube and we run it right through the cervix, and then we inject the sperm. Okay, surgical insemination is tried and true. The only problem is that you have to knock the bitch out for anesthesia. Skin to skin, um, we're probably about 15 minutes. Um, I've done surgical incision, sur surgical implants on dogs and taken them to show the next day. They'd be great. <laughs> the incision's this big, you know, it's a little bikini cut. Um, so that's the, the important of each for timing. For artificial insemination, you don't have to be that exact because you're going to get two to three breedings at least. Okay? For transcervical insemination, you can get two breedings for that unless you're using frozen. If you're using frozen, you're going to do it five and a half days after the LH surge, right? Okay. Surgical insemination, you have to be like right exact on, and that has to be five and a half days after the LH surge. Because you have to give that frozen semen time to get exactly where they need to be. What right? progesterone do you use for surgical? Pardon? What number do you use for progesterone for surgical? I don't. You don't? No. Okay. You don't do your LH instead? I do my LH instead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you, the reason, the reason I, the question is, the question is what progesterone do I do? I do my, my implants. I don't. I do it on my LH. And the other thing is, is that, um, yeah, the, I've had progesterones of 29 where the bitch has gotten pregnant. Okay, I've been a huge Great Dane litter. I've had bitches that, that have progesterones of 10. 
and they get pregnant. So all of them are different. I can tell you that Orly was 18 last night. Okay. Okay, so surgical insemination, like I said, you have to be exact. Or if you're gonna do a, so I have some clients that really wanna get their dogs pregnant, so we do artificial insemination on day two. We do transcervical on day four. We do surgical on day five and a half. You know, they really wanna get them pregnant. Then they don't care about spending the money, so I do, okay, you wanna do that, we'll do that, so. Silly. Okay, so the importance of time is for each, we did that, okay. Okay, now before we get this started, this is a scoping, and I'm gonna have you stop it at a certain, at a certain point. What we're doing is we're looking through that scope, and this is our TV monitor, and this is what we see. These are vaginal holes, okay? This is a bitch that is ready to be bred. If she's not ready to be bred, you see a lot of blood in there. Okay, you don't see a lot of blood in there. Or if you've been traumatic, you're gonna see a lot of blood. Okay, go ahead and turn it on. See that ugly thing in the middle? That is the cervix. That is exactly what the cervix looks like when you want to breathe. I mean, isn't that cool? You really, you really have to get into these things. It really is cool. <laughs> what, what you would do, what, what, what you would do. Put the arrow on the ugly thing. Yeah, point to it. Put the arrow on it. No, over. Ugly, ugly thing, right there, that hole. <laughs> the hole. The hole is a cervix. The hole is that, see how ugly that is? That bingo, that's it. Bingo, you are now in the cervix. And what you do is you take a tube, we have a tube that we pass down our scope, and you take the tube and you go down the scope, and you go right through that into the uterus. So you are actually in the uterus. And uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. So, and it works so well. The bitch is standing. You don't have to give her, well, spoiler, I don't know if she's still standing. But um, the, the bitches just stand there. They, they don't care. Sometimes you have to give them a little bit of uh, tranquilizer, but most of the time they just stand there. It's amazing. Okay, you can finish that. Is there a reason that it's upside down? Yeah. <laughs> How can you tell it's upside down? <laughs> yeah. That's okay. She was standing on her head. Yeah. She was standing on her head. Yeah. Those nurses sometimes I just can't do it. Okay, we're ready. <coughs> Multiple sire litters. The cost. Okay, hold. Let's go back to surgical implants. Okay. Um, because we're gonna speak to see a big uterus and I can kind of move things around on the big uterus for you later. But in order to do a sur surgical implant, you make a little, a little tiny incision that's about, right about here. And it's between the last two mammaries on the bitch. And when you make the little tiny incision, you take a spade hook and you hook the uterus and you pull it out. Oh, it's done. <laughs> Wait till you see the C-section, that's a big deal. And you, and you pull it out and you actually inject into each one. Some people inject in the body, I don't. I inject into each one as close to the ovaries as I can get. And then you just stick it back in there, you just shove it back in, shake it around a little bit, <laughs> suture her up, and put your three skin sutures in. Or if you're going to a show the next day, you just glue it. Okay. <laughs> well, what I do, okay, what do you, how do you know that you're getting up to the tube, up to the oviduct, okay? The way you do that is you put your fingers in there like that and you pinch it off distally. You pinch it off on the part that goes out to the great outdoors. You pinch it off like that and you shove it up until it stops going. Then you go to the other side and you pinch it off like that and then you, you uh, do your second injection into the second horn, and it can only go in one way. It can't go out. So that's how you do it. Yeah. This is pretty, it's so easy. So, I mean, it really is. We charge a lot of money, but it's really easy. <laughs> <laughs> we charge a lot of money. Yeah. 
charge a lot. <laughs> okay, multiple sire litters. Okay, it's expensive to have a multiple sire litter. It's going to be outrageously expensive to register this litter because you have to do DNA on the bitch and every male that could possibly be the father. Then you have to do DNA on every puppy. Orly, please only have four. Um, <laughs> you have to do DNA on every puppy. So, um, and to register the litter itself, instead of being the usual cost to register the litter, it's $250 to register the litter, plus $10 per puppy. So you're doing, doing DNA. Let's say we have, we have a litter of 10 puppies. That's $400 for, for the 10 puppies. That's four, four parents. That's $160. That's $560 just to get the DNA on my puppies and my dogs. Okay? That's expensive. I mean, that's really, really expensive. That's something you do for, for CC of A. <laughs> this is something that I was very lucky to have a bitch that came to the heat exactly at this time, and she was very, very good to me. So this is why we're doing it. And don't you have to DNA each pup? Yeah, that's a, that's the $40 per pup times 10 pups. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you know you can do that off of the dew clause. What? You can do that off of the dew clause. Oh, yeah, I take them off at the same time. Thank you oh. very much. Well, it's blood. Yeah. 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 It's blood you can do off the dew closet. Okay. Reason to do multiple sire litters. Collie Club of America. That's a reason. Okay. If it's the older bitch in the last litter, and you really want to breed to these two dogs, just do it. Just do it. See what you get. You know, it is. It's no harder on the bitch to be bred to two dogs than it is to be bred to one dog. And um, the other thing is poor sperm quality of one male. Remember, I told you it takes 1,000 sperm to agitate an egg before that one lucky guy gets in. So if you have a dog that has poor sperm quality, <coughs> that's when I would mix the two together. If you have a dog with poor sperm quality and a dog with good sperm quality, I would mix the two together, and then I'd look at it to make sure they're not killing each other, because that could happen. That could happen, okay? Sometimes you have to tell someone. Anyway, and if they look like they're fine together, then what I would do is I would inseminate them together at the same time, and then hope that the right ones get in. He's knocking on the door in a couple others. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Wow. That's, what, that's what you, and that's what you hope for. And it does work, because I can tell you, I, I, I actually did it with a mixed breed dog with a really good dog. And we ended up with, with a bunch of mixed breed puppies and then a bunch of really good dogs. So it was, it was pretty cool. Okay, so a thousand and one lucky one gets in. Okay. Ovulation timing, ask the stud dog, some bitches stand all the time or won't stand. I've had bitches that stand in, when they're not in heat. <laughs> I've had, I, have a, I have a little dachshund that comes in and she will back up to anything. <laughs> so some bitches stand all the time. And other bitches are just mean. You know, they, they, when it comes, they're aggressive, dominant bitches. They're not mean. They're, they're aggressive, they're bitches. Yeah, they're home. Yeah, they're, they're aggressive, dominant bitches, and um, and they won't let the male near them. Now, if I've already done my exam and I'm sure she doesn't have a stricture and I'm sure she doesn't have a, a, a septum in there or anything else like that, then probably the reason that she's so upset is that she just doesn't feel like getting bred that day. No, she got a headache. <laughs> so of course, I, I've done my vaginal smears. I've done my progesterones. I know when to breed. I've done my LH search, so I really, 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 really know, know when to breed. Okay. okay, this is what we're gonna go through a little bit in our wet lab. <coughs> the stages of heat, proestrus. It lasts three to 10 days. It's a swollen vulva, the blood tinge discharge, the cytology, you get a lot of red blood cells in there. That's when they bleed. And do you know how they bleed? Uh, Proestrus is, is um, or the bleeding part is all estrogen driven, and what estrogen does is it makes it makes the swell it makes the cells in the vulva separate, and blood seeps through. 
They're not actually bleeding. The blood seeps through. It has a term. It's called diapodesis. It's a neat term. And this is what this is what proestrus looks like. You have really big round cells with really big nuclei. Okay. This is before, and then you've got all these little red blood cells all around. Okay. But that's what proestrus looks like. And a bitch is not ready to be bred. If, you, if you're breeding by cytologies, the bitch is just in early, in early in her heat cycle. Okay, next one. <coughs> okay, estrus, my favorite one. Estrus looks like crinkled pieces of paper. It looks like tissue paper. See it up there on the top? The edges fold back. It's, the nucleus goes away. That big circle that was in the middle goes away and they've got crinkled edges and they fold back on themselves. If you're going by your, your um, slides alone, that is when you want to start breeding and breed day two, four, six. Okay, I would breed actually as soon as I saw that. So zero, two, four, six. And what happens at that point, everything is getting ready and this is where the estrogen is starting to drop down and the progesterone is starting to come up. Now, diestrus means it's all done. Okay, as soon as the bitch is done with her receptivity, diestrus means it's all done. You got some more of those big cells with the big, big circles in the middle of them, the epithelial cells are like that. You got this? Do I have? There's another big cell, okay? The other thing you have, are, see all these things out here? Those are all white blood cells. Those crinkly looking things out there are all white blood cells. And that's when you get in diesters. As soon as that one's over, this is what happens. And then you know you're done breeding. Don't breed anymore, because you're just wasting the sperm. So that's this. is the period between when you should have been pregnant or you should have been bred. When you're either pregnant or should have been pregnant. Anestrus is from that point until your next heat cycle. And it depends on the bitch. Usually it's anywhere from four to six months. I have seen bitches that go almost a year in between heat cycles. But that's what anestrus looks like. This is a vaginal cytology from anestrus. It just looks like debris. That's all it looks like. It looks like junk. <coughs> Any questions as far as the slides? Because we're going to be doing them. Okay. If you have bitches having silent seasons, when they never swell, they never have a discharge, and unless you're checking progesterones every couple of weeks for months, you don't know that they're in season. I wouldn't do that. I would check her every month for progesterone. I would. And if you want to, every two weeks, I'd do a bad home spin. Would you repeat that question or stay? Okay, the question is if you have a dog that does silent heat, okay, um, how do you know that she's in heat without doing progesterones every two weeks? Number one, I would do them every month. I would do a progesterone every month, okay? And you can use, you can use the target test. Um, or I would do vaginal smears every couple of weeks and see where you are. No, it does not. The question is, does it do the serum separator tubes uh, change what you get for the um, um, the progesterone test? And the answer is no. You just so, yeah. Uh, are split seasons common? Um, I mean, you have problems. Split seasons are kind of interesting. Um, usually what happens is that the bitch, the bitch will start to go into heat, but she never, she never actually ovulates. And then she'll just go back down to a resting cycle. And then the next time she'll ovulate, which could be a month later, which could be two months later. And I would be inclined to breed her on her second half of her split cycle. And a lot of times that will throw them back into normal cycling. Well, if you if you have a bitch that comes into heat every less than every four months, okay, less than every four months, and does a real heat cycle every four months, then you have a problem, okay, because the uterus wants to go back to normal during that anastrous period. It wants to get back to, you know, it's normal sheath and everything in there. So it wants to go back to normal. So in situations like that, what I do is I put my bitches on mavolabone or on check drops and I keep them out of heat for like six to seven, 
Six to seven months. What? Now, I'm going to talk about yeah. Um, the question, the statement was, um, I sent a bitch out, and the bitch was in heat when it left town. But by the time it got to the other end of the, on the other end of the trip, it was no longer in heat. But then it came back in heat a couple of weeks later. That's not unusual at all. That's, that's what is so great about chilled semen and about frozen semen, because it takes the worry out of being close. I mean, you don't have to be right there with that dog anymore. You can ship semen anywhere all over the world. Would you bring the bitches in um, where I have you can't catch their cycle? Would I bring them into heat? Yeah. The question is, would I bring a bitch into heat? Yes, I've done it numerous times. Okay, it, um, what you do is you inject a, and it, she has to be out of heat for at least four to six months. Let's say I want to go somewhere, okay, and I really, really want to go on this trip, but, but, but the bitch's cycle is in my way. I might either delay her with check drops or bring her into heat earlier with an obby plant. Two questions. First question. What's an obby plant? Bring her to veterinary to sound the season body. Do you sound seems Not at all. Not at all. Why? Because I usually get the bitches pregnant. Oh, I always, oh, oh, listen, I always ask them. I always ask them, what are the sisters like? You know, blah, blah, blah. And if it is hereditary, I tell them, don't do it. Why breed bad bitches? Or why breed dogs that have a bad history? I don't care how beautiful they are. I don't care what great winners they are. I don't care anything like that. If they're produced, if bad bitches produce bad bitches, stay away from it, unless you breed into a great dog line. Okay. Are you using cabergoline to induce? No, I don't use cabergoline because I have obby plant. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Never a problem with this, but not a few of I have never had a problem. I have never had what a problem. What do you do? Do you have plantations? Do you do? Question for people. Okay, okay. This is all this is all like six slides later, but that's okay. Okay. Okay, anyway, what I want you guys to know about these things is that in proestrus, which is early, pro means early. The cells are big and round with big and round nuclei and lots of red blood cells. Okay? In estrus, they look like tissue paper that's been folded back on itself. That's when you want to breathe. When they're, when they're folded back on themselves. In, an, in diestrus, which is at the end of their heat cycle, they will convert back to the big round cells with the big round nuclei, but instead of having a bunch of red blood cells around, they have a bunch of white blood cells around. Okay? And don't let me forget about ovulation. Okay. Okay, forget ovulation three days after the first sign of behavioral estrus, but because I have this one dog that just came in the other day again, and she's, she shows signs of estrus all the time. She flags. She does the whole thing. Two days after the LH, <laughs> that's when I'll go by. Two days after the LH is when you have ovulation. Your fresh semen, you're going to breed on, after your LH, you're going to breed two, four, six. Chilled semen, you're going to breed three, five. Frozen semen, breed day five and a half now. You can put point five there. Okay? That's just a reminder of when to breed. All right? The eggs are ready for ovulation three days after, uh, fertilization three days after ovulation. Actual fertilization occurs in the oviduct. It doesn't occur in the uterus, it occurs in the oviduct. There are three parts of, of um, pregnancy. The first one is the fertilization. Well, first what happens is that the egg is fertilized. I mean, the egg, the egg erupts from the side of the, of the um, of the ovary and it grows for about three or four days and then what happens is that it'll get fertilized and then it stays up there for a little while and it goes down to the uterus and it implants in the uterine wall and then the next stage of pregnancy is delivery so those are the those are the parts <laughs> okay implantation occurs about 17 to 18 days after breeding you ovulate eggs at different days Okay? 
It's not all on the same day. You might ovulate on day, day two, day two and a half, day three, after your LA surge. And your fertilization may not occur all, at the, all exactly at the same time. But what happens is that those eggs leave the oviduct all at the same time, okay? The embryos enter the uterus at day eight to 12. Implantation of those eggs occurs, those fertilized eggs now, all occurs at the same time. So they all implant into the uterus at exactly the same time. So these things about, well, I've read early, I've read late, I've got little puppies, I've got big puppies, is not true. What is true is that every single one of those embryos implanted at the same time. So what that means is that if one's big and one's little, just means two of them implanted too, big, too close together. That's all it means. It doesn't mean from, that one was from the first breeding, the other one was from the last breeding. Okay? Now we're to diagnosing pregnancy. You don't have to pay an arm and a leg to do that. Yes? Uh, what is that implant? Why do some puppies stop growing and become mummified? Like a, a puppy delivered that they were like mummified until they were a puppy, but they just obviously were grown and they can be mummified. There are a lot of things. If the puppies are too close together, one will kick the other one out. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that, please? The question is, is why when you have two puppies that are born, like one right after the other, does one look mummified and the other one does not? And there are ways that one puppy will kick another one out. They're just too close together and the stronger survives. Um, diagnosing pregnancy. My favorite way of diagnosing pregnancy is by ultrasound. And I usually do ultrasound at about day, well, I can do it as early as day 19, and I'll show you at day 19, but I usually like to do them when they're a little bit later so I can get a good heartbeat. So I usually do them about day 24 to 28, after the LH surge. Palpation, I can do about three to four weeks after four weeks. At three weeks, they feel like little tiny quarter-sized pieces inside the abdomen. But after, after four weeks, what happens, everything gets so big, so you can't feel those individual pieces and it's hard to palpate at that time. You don't know whether she's fat or whether she's got puppies. Okay, here is an ultrasound of a pregnant bitch. This is like a 19-day like bitch, just to show you that you can do it. There is the placenta, okay? And there's the puppy. That little thing in there is the puppy, that's great. That little thing in there is a the puppy. So that's what it looks like, and that's when I that's when I confirm pregnancy. I usually bring them back a week later because I like to see heartbeats. Now with the relaxing test, the thing that I want to tell you about that. You can get false positives on it, that's the first thing. If your bitch has some sort of underlying problem, um, like she has, she's in liver failure. I had a Doberman that was, had copper storage disease and he's in liver failure. But if your bitch um, has some sort of underlying problem, you can actually get a false negative on this. I rarely get false positives because what the relaxin does and what the relaxin registers is it registers a chemical that is produced by the, the uh, embryo with a live fetus inside. So if you have this, and it's positive, and they're on day, like day, day, day 27 or 28, I would do it again, and I probably would do it every week to make sure I wasn't getting any problems. Because it will go down, and it won't register once a puppy dies, once the puppy starts to die. Okay? Hmm? It's a blood test. Yeah, it's a real simple blood test. Once you know how to pull blood and spin it down, it's really simple. What about if you get a negative and the Yeah. Well, then I well then I do it again, and I have to tell you this is before ultrasound was in, and I kept looking at this bitch that that uh, was not supposed to be pregnant. She kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, <laughs> and finally I radiographed her at 45 days, and I know your bitch who's in liver failure is pregnant. So, yeah. But now we ultrasound. You know, if I if I feel if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. So I will go ahead and I will do that. Well, now we know what your puppy's names are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> quack, quack, quack. Quack, quack, quack. 
Yeah. 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 All righty. Here is a little ultrasound of a movie. This is obviously a, a bitch that has been bred many, many times. As you can tell by the giant nipples. <coughs> <laughs> See the mini? Look at those mini. But it's a Frenchy bulldog, you know? And if you can hear the sound I'm here, you hear her go. <laughs> but you will see a heart in there. Can you see it? It's right there. And actually what we do is we count the heartbeats. Because a normal heartbeat for a puppy should be well over 200 if they're healthy. <clears throat> so we, we go ahead and we run it. And we do a couple of runs just to make sure. Hmm. But the, the, the normal puppy heart rate should be over two, it should be well over 200. If you're getting before delivery, and your puppy heart rate goes down to below 150, then you're in trouble. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll start following our bitches as they're getting closer and closer to pregnancy, and we'll actually do ultrasounds every day. Those are also with the people that have more money than God. <laughs> but what, what we do at our hospital is we do, day, you only pay on alternate days, so. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, is that I want to know this. I want to know when they're going to come. And if you don't have an exact date, you don't have an LH, then a lot of times you can just pick it up from radiographs because the puppy's toes form right before they're ready to, to uh, deliver. So write that down. Puppy toes on x -ray. I'm serious. I'm serious. If, if there are no toes, don't do the C-section. <laughs> Where do they form? Um, they form on day 63. <laughs> Bones start coming at day 42. Yes, ma'am. How accurate is predicting numbers of puppies from the ultrasound? How, the question is how accurate is predicting puppies at, uh, at ultrasound? Not very. Not very. I can tell people they have more than one or two or three or four, but I, know, I always radiograph. I always, I always bring them back in um, anywhere from like 49 to 56 days to, to uh, radiograph so I can count puppies, especially if I have a planned C-section so I know how much staff to have around. <laughs> okay, so that's that. <laughs> okay, care during pregnancy. And I know everybody has a way to do it. And I'm really excited about hearing about one of these ways of doing it. Diet. My feeling about the diet is that you should have a dog on a good, balanced diet. A commercial diet, if at all possible, that is for growth. I don't really want you changing diets and going from one thing to the other because I don't want the bitch sick. Um, as far as supplementations, I do not supplement. Um, folic acid for pug-nosed dogs is about the only thing I do because there is some indication that um, for pug-nosed dogs it helps with cleft pellets. Um, no vitamin D because it causes kink tails, ears, etc. Um, sometimes I will use fatty acids, some omega fatty acids. I just don't do it. I, do, I don't add anything. A lot of people do salmon oil. I don't do that. I just feel I feed a good food. Um, the progesterone testing, if it's, a pro if it's a problem bitch line, I test weekly. And there's a reason for doing that. The number one reason for resorption in bitches is ovarian failure. Okay? In a bitch, the only thing that produces progesterone, which keeps the puppies alive, is the ovary. And if the ovary fails, then the bitch is going to lose the litter. She's going to resorb the litter. If, if it fails early in pregnancy, you can't do a thing about it. If it fails late in pregnancy, you can do something about it. But once I have determined my, that my bitch is pregnant, I bring her in weekly, and I do a progesterone on her. If it drops below, like, five, well, actually, if it drops below six, 
I start them on a supplementation. And there are different supplementations that you can use. You can use Premarin. Um, you can use um, injectable. Bless you. Thank you. You can use um, injectable um, estrogen. I mean, injectable progesterone. Um, you can use Regimate. The good thing about using Regimate is that if you can continue to, to pull progesterone levels, your Regimate will not impede the ability to read what your progesterone is. So, but I like to use, I usually use Premarin or I use the injection now. The injection is given every three days. Um, you stop it three days before it's time. Three days before it's time to deliver. Um, with Regimate, I usually stop three to five days before it's time to deliver. And they usually go right into delivery. Or I do a C-section, which I usually do in myself. All right. A lot of times we plan our C-sections, and, and I'm a big one for planning a C-section at a time when um, I'm awake. That's not <laughs> At a time when I'm having a full staff. Um, and I also like to plan my C-sections during the week, so we have the weekend free. So we do a lot of planning with our C-sections. Um, one of the biggest drugs that we use, let's, let's say that we have a bitch that comes in and, and we know that she's due on Friday or Saturday and the people really want to keep the puppies there until, until they absolutely have to. What we will do is we will use a drug called terbutaline. And the terbutaline, if that bitch starts to go into, into labor, we give her little tiny doses of terbutaline. It's the same thing that's given to, to humans. And what it does is it stops the contractions. Then we bring her into the office first thing in the morning and we deliver the puppy. So it's more of, it, you know, what it does is it allows us to be set for the C-section. Not one of these emergency C-sections where you call, you know, John Q. Public out in the middle of the night who's never done a C-section okay. and you ask him to do it. All right. You're going to have a vet give you to keep it home so that you don't have to go into the office? No, I, what I do is I give it to them when they come for their exam. Absolutely. If you're just doing premature labor, mm -hmm. and it starts at 2 o'clock in the morning, how do you stop? I want your bitch in that Friday, and I want to ultrasound her heart. I want to ultrasound the puppy's heart. Okay. And if your puppy's hearts, if your puppy's hearts are good, then we're not going to do the C-section then. Okay. And I'm going to give you the tributaline to, to take home, and if she okay. starts nesting, That's what you're going to give it to her every four hours. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, absolutely. I'm going to give it to you to take home. I'm going to show you how to do it. You're going to be doing it. And it works great. It stops premature contraction. No, it's sub-Q. It's sub-Q. It's easy to do. And it's something that most vets don't either know about or they won't tell you about it. But then you get bored without toes. I know. Yeah. That's what they bored without toes. Well, you don't, I mean, there's so many things that you can do to stop premature, premature delivery. I mean, number one, you can, if your bitch is losing her, her progesterone, if her progesterone's dry, dying because her, her, her ovary shut, is shutting down, her, her little corpus luteum, which is the name of it, if, if that's happening, then what's going to happen is you're going to give a supplementation of either Regimate, injectable progesterone, or um, Premarin. And you're going to give that, and you're going to check your bitch's progesterone to make sure it's high enough to keep the pregnancy going. So that's what you're going to do in the beginning. And then you're going to say, okay, I'm going to stop this two days. I'm going to stop it two days before delivery. But I want those puppies to stay in there for two more days. And you've taken them to the vet, and the vet ultrasounds and says heart rates are 260. Mm -hmm. So you're good. But I'm going to tell you, before you go home, I'm going to give you six injections or eight injections of tributaline. And if that bitch starts going into labor at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to start giving it every three to four hours. And that will stop the labor. And then come in first thing in the morning when there is a full staff of fully awake people that you don't have emergency situations. That's when you see the first contraction? No. You, you see active, contra active contractions. You see active nesting. You know what I mean by that? Okay, active nesting is when the, bitch is, when the bitch will start going, she'll nest real hard and then all of a sudden she'll get a contraction like this. And once she gets that contraction, you get your injection. Okay. You know, you see it's going to be faster. All right? Sub-Q. Sub-Q. 
Okay, good. The tribunaling in your refrigerator, I used to get it to them like three days before. Yeah, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it until you come in. No, no. It can be dangerous. It can be, and it's not dangerous. If it's used properly, it is not a dangerous drug. I mean, I've had psychologists use it before. And then I was. Yes, sir. Your progesterone will drop in a normal bitch of 24 to 48 hours before she has a puppy. That's a natural thing, right? It will naturally happen in a bitch. The question is, what happens to the progesterone right before delivery? Um, usually, your progesterone will, will drop below two about 12 to 24 hours before delivery. Sometimes it drops below two before you want them to deliver. Okay, so that's when you in, that's when you in, intervene, and that's what. Let's say that you're at day 45. Okay. And all of a sudden you come in for a progesterone and your progesterone is um, seven. I'm gonna get scared and I'm gonna start you on some supplementation. And that supplementation is gonna be to keep your progesterone high. And then I'm gonna have you take it off, take the bitch off like two to three days before. And then her progesterone will really was dropping. It'll automatically drop and then those babies will start to come. The temperature usually goes down. It usually goes down before, but uh, I usually like to see it about 98, but sometimes it'll go down to 99. And it usually does that about um, two days, a day or two before they're gonna deliver. Bitches usually stop eating before they're delivering. I have had bitches eat while they're delivering. <laughs> so, you know, you can't really go, you know, you can't really go by that. Um, each one is an individual, but if, like I said, if if it's two o'clock in the morning and your bitch goes into heat, I mean, it goes into, into hard labor, just start pumping them full of the terbutaline. And it's very safe and we dose it out. I mean, we actually pull it up in the syringe. So you know, you don't even have to think at two o'clock in the morning. You just go out there, pick the skin up and shoot it. That's it. And then come in first thing in the morning and we'll take over. Okay, safe medications. We went over this already, none really after the first three weeks of age. Cef Plavomox, Ceflex, and Batril. Um, I don't use anything else, yeah. Getting back to ovarian failure and a puppy reabsorbing the litter, a bitch reabsorbing the litter, is that a bitch you want to breed again? Will she have ovarian failure again? Mm, no, I gotta tell you, different things can cause, the question is, is once a bitch has an ovarian failure, is it always gonna have an ovarian, ovarian no, failure? No, there are so many things that come into play. And, you know, you can go to the phase of the moon, the weather. Um, she had an infection. Um, there was there was a, an, almost like an RH factor, or an argument between the male and the female. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things. But if once that bitch has an ovarian failure, I make sure I test her because I don't want that to happen again. Mm -hmm. I don't. What do you want test? To. I test progesterone every week. Oh, yeah. Every week. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Do you think the age of the bitch has anything to do? Well, I can give you a little story. Um, does, does the thank you? Does the age of the bitch have anything to do with it? I had a bitch. With, what was the question? Um, I had a bitch that was on on um, check drops for six years that delivered ten puppies. So she's atypical. Yes. She's atypical. <laughs> how about, um, for your question, how about the, uh, the lifestyle you might have dominant bitch that will like that? She will keep that. You keep a dominant bitch that you'll, you mean like if you have a whole kennel? Yeah, they're all bitches grounded, you've got one that's dominant. Okay, that's that called the bar effect. The bar effect. The bar effect, yeah, it's called the bar effect. It doesn't occur in dogs. And that's when you have a dominant bitch that, that only her, that she will be the only one that carries to term. Yeah, like in the wild, yeah, exactly. But yeah, well, it's, it's, it's not an old wives' tale. It just doesn't uh, occur in, in dogs. <coughs> Trauma. Trauma. One of my biggest things when a bitch is pregnant is stop agility, please. I mean, I have people that want to take their bitches to agility, and I go, why are you doing this? Why are you, you know? 
Your bitch is carrying your, your future agility champions in it. Why are you doing it? Is it true to keep them quiet for the first two weeks after breeding? I don't think really that helpful. Is it true to keep them quiet for the first two weeks of pregnancy? No, it's not true. Take your dog out for a walk. Don't let it go running around anywhere and get bashed. Not, not back out in the, the kennel pack or that. <coughs> not normal. Like you want to still keep it a little removed from that. And, uh, yeah, you want to keep it a little, more, a little more confined. But you want to make sure your bitch gets exercise. Your bitch has got to be exercised because one of the worst things about delivery is if your bitch is a big old fat hump, she's not going to deliver well. So I like long walks, long wrist walks. But as far as trauma, oh my God, stop, stop agility, stop. And remember, those babies are implanted by by like 20 days. They're implanted, so you can dislodge them any time then. Okay. So. Okay. I have a question. What about the set before they're implanted? If they're racing around, and is, is, it, is that a time to keep them quiet so they will implant? Okay, the question is, what, what about before they implant when they're racing around and everything like that? Um, it's probably less likely to cause a, a separation because they're not stuck to anything. Um, and in all honesty, the sperm and the egg are not the smartest in the world. So, you know, you probably would be okay. And I can tell you that I brought a bitch on an airplane with me, and well, she's being bred right now. But will it cause them not to implant? No. Okay. It doesn't cause them not to implant. Okay. So you're okay. That you're okay. It doesn't <laughs> cause them not to implant. Okay. Can I yes, you may. If you have a doctor that kind of trauma, is there something you can do that can help ensure that they're Trauma. I had a bitch that fell in a swimming pool. Okay? And right across her belly, right across her belly. There's nothing I could do. Nothing. You know, it's just one of those accidents that happen. If you have a bitch with a progesterone drop um, to the point where no, some of the puppies. The question is, if you have puppies that are in your ultrasound, you make sure those puppies are dead. No, I'm saying if if you have a progesterone drop and you know that this is causing fetal loss and you're not supplementing, uh, can any of the puppies survive without supplementation or will it be? No, you have to give supplementation, but first you have to diagnose life. <coughs> okay, and the only way that at that point that you're going to be able to diagnose life because your, your relaxing test isn't going to work because you've got dying puppies. So what you need to do is you need to go in and you need to ultrasound that bitch and make sure you still have heartbeats and hope that the heartbeats are high. Mm -hmm. And then you can supplement that bitch, absolutely. Okay, but if you don't supplement, you're going to lose the whole Probably. Okay. Probably, yeah. That's usually what happens. Okay, let's see where we are. How are we doing, Tom? It is 1043. All righty. Well, be natural versus cesarean section. Plan, not plan. Mine are all planned. My C sections are all planned. Um, I have trained my emergency clinic around the corner that. If there is an emergency, I talk to my client and I send them over there because they're usually clients that haven't kept up on their on their uh, pre-breeding testing and their breeding their um, uh, their pregnancies. They have not kept up their exams, so I send them over there. I've taught them my way of doing a C-section, and they're great at it. So when to intervene? Okay, if you go down to number five, wealth-wise. If you are a first-time breeder, the best thing you can do is remember Wealthwise. Wealthwise is a company that sends you a monitor that you put on your bitch, and it monitors the contractions of the uterus. It also monitors the heartbeats, so you know what the heartbeats are of your babies, and you know if you're getting into fetal distress. <coughs> remember I told you under 150? If those babies are under 150, they're in distress. So when Wealthwise is, they, they will actually tell, tell you, and then it's a little monitor, it's like a little Doppler that they put on the stomach, and they can just put it up on your telephone and you send it to them. 
They're there 24 seven for you. Um, we supply you with calcium injections and oxytocin injections that you take home. And they're all pre-measured so you don't have to measure a, sim a single thing. And Wellflies will tell you, okay, your contractions are coming, get ready for a puppy. Now, let's say a puppy doesn't come. Then they say, okay, give this and this, and the puppy comes. If they start to see the puppy's heartbeat starting to drop, they will call us and schedule a C-section. So they actually help hold your hand over the telephone while your puppies are being whelmed. <coughs> I mean, it's one of the best things that's ever happened to veterinary medicine. It really is. They work well, they, they know what's going on, um, and whelp-wise is, they cost like 600 bucks. So it's another $600 on top of everything. And then if you end up in a C-section, C-section, <coughs> yes? Is there a way to, monitor, like, could we monitor the contractions at home ourselves? Unless you get a Doppler, not really. You really have to have a, do a Doppler. I mean, it's... Easy to get a Doppler. Hmm? Easy to get a Doppler. You can yeah. Them but then you've got to be trained. You've got to be trained. Yeah. You can get one. And go through, what I would do is I would get through it, go through it once with uh, Well Blast. And then you just do it on your own. So you can do it like that. Um, a couple of things that I always have around when I'm doing a, when I'm doing a delivery. One of them is Dopram, and you, you all know what Dopram does. You put a couple of drops underneath the tongue, and it causes the puppy to inspire and expire. Okay, it doesn't work that easily. Don't think it works that easily. No. There's a lot. You're going to see reviving puppies very shortly. Um, the other thing that I want you to know, we were talking about this, is that there is an acupuncture point on all of us that makes us breathe. Okay, it makes us go, you know about this? Right there. Got that? And you don't just do like tickle, 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 you push hard. Dr. Cindy, could you explain that to people who are screaming? They're looking at you going as a question. I got my finger in my mouth. I got my lip up. I got my finger in my mouth. Here. It's, it's right above your two teeth. Your two big teeth. It's where that little thing is. Yeah. Yeah. See? Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> okay, you got the mouth, right? It's in the mouth. Yes, ma'am. No. No, 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 but they do it there, so that's all right. But it's, a, it's an acupuncture point right here. And you, I mean, you push hard. You don't just push soft, you push hard. Not hard enough to break the jaw. Do you do that? And they're doing that up here, so. Do you do that in addition to the dopram? Yes, you can. You can do both of them. I do it right here, but you can also do it up here. I know, so I always do it here. You may do it in addition to the dopram. What I do not want you to do is to inject dopram under the tongue. Do not, and some people do inject Dopram, not just put a couple of drops under the tongue. Um, if you want to, and you can figure out which one is the umbilical vein, you can, you can shove some up the vessels. Um, but this is usually just putting a couple drops in there is enough. So that's what you're going to have around. Um, and wellwise, like I said, if it's your first litter that you've ever done, first get a really good friend to help you. Okay, that's really, really important. Somebody that's experienced would be preferred. preferred. Not, your, not, your, not your, your drinking buddy. Okay, the other thing, the other thing that you want to do is you, is you want to get wealth-wise, and you want, you want wealth-wise there with you. Okay, they're great. And you want to get together with a veterinarian that's understanding that this is not going to screw you over. You know, like, somebody that will work with you. And if you can't, call me. Okay.
All right, now this is, everybody gets to take a little nap. This is a C-section. This is, this is a planned C-section at our hospital. This is a Labrador Retriever. And it's so planned that, that um, we have one nurse per puppy that comes out. That's perfect. Oh, nobody gets grossed out. <laughs> <coughs> and these puppies are big. I mean, oh. <laughs> all that, but wait, there's more. You can see how she's, see how she's just took off an adhesion? Yeah. This bitch had had a previous C-section. Then we will take that, that, you won't see it, 
but we take that um, tight off place and we throw it back in the uterus, we suture it up, okay? And we take all the puppies out, and we try to use as many holes as, as, as few holes as possible. And we take out all the puppies, and then after that, what we do is we send them home with oxytocin. Okay, all of our bitches post C-section go home with oxytocin. Okay, one of the biggest problems is overdosing oxytocin. We usually go with like, half a unit for a small dog, six, six um, syringes, with like one and a half units for a collie-sized dog, and maybe three, minute, three units for a giant dog. And we send home six syringes, one to be given every eight hours for the next two days. The purpose for that is to dump all this crap out of the uterus, and the other purpose for that is that it causes more milk letdown. Okay, so every eight hours. Yeah, the other thing, the other thing that you have to remember is that if you've got a bitch and you're trying to welcome her home and, and she's got a puppy that's stuck in the uter in her uterine horn or it's stuck, it's mis mispresented, and you start hitting that bitch with oxytocin and calcium, you are going to rupture the uterus. Okay? Or you're going to, if she has a twisted uterus, you know, this is why Welkwise is so good. They will tell you if there is a problem. And if, if um, I had a, a woman with the Yorkshire Terrier that ruptured the uterus, she gave it, she gave it a half a cc of oxytocin. I mean, that's like, that's like enough for a cow. When you so, say the unit of oxytocin or half a cc. Look at the, look at the bottle, it's, yeah. Yeah, the mills, it's just teeny, teeny bits. It's just very, very small bits. But uterine torsion, if a, if a bitch presents with uterine torsion, it will be one of the most painful things in the world. She will be walking around, they get shocky just like with bloat. I mean, they look like a, they look like, um, a bitch that's bloating. And this is a true medical emergency because if you don't get them into the veterinarian right away and something is not done, the bitch will die. The other thing that we usually do after we think that we've had all the puppies taken out, and remember, in the perfect world, we usually x-ray before we do uh, a C-section or while the, pup, while the dog is pregnant, while the bitch is pregnant, we x-ray. So we have an idea of how many puppies, but we usually re-x-ray after a bitch has done a natural whelping to make sure there's not a puppy retained. Because if there is a puppy retained, that puppy will become, and if it dies inside, it will become septic and it will make the bitch septic. So that's one of the other things that if somebody delivers at home, and we're not sure that every puppy's come out, then we go ahead and we take a radiograph just to make sure. Yes? So that brings up a question. Um, for people who do uh, whelping at home, do you recommend doing a, an oxytocin shot at the end to? No. Question, please. I recommend, okay, the question is, do I recommend giving an oxytocin shot at the end? No, I recommend giving, I, no, giving three oxytocin shots for two days. And only a very very small amount. So like, uh, it's like it's like one it's like uh, 1.5 units. What's a unit? What's a unit? Yeah. Okay, I don't, have, I don't have my bottle in front of me, so I can't tell you. I just tell my nurses to make me have 1.5 units. It's a little teeny bit. Hold it, I can look it up for you. It's not half cc. It's more like it's more like a tenth of a cc. You can give them a tenth of a cc. Yeah, that little. that little. But you can give, but you can actually give him a tenth of a cc per, a tenth of a cc in a collie-sized dog, a tenth of a cc once a day. I mean, three times a day for two days. That's what I would do. Do not give that huge shot of oxytocin right after they're done with labor because it hurts. It's extremely painful. Yeah, your bitch will, your bitch will start vomiting and everything else. It's just not worth it to them to do that. To them. After the last puppy, I usually have a cup of coffee, go in and look at my puppies, weigh them all, and bang, bang, so maybe a half hour, maybe a half hour, that's it. Yeah. But if you think you have a puppy stuck in there, if you've held pain and you feel anything that feels uncomfortable or unusual to you, please take her into a veterinarian and get her checked out because she can become septic, she can retain that puppy inside of there, and that does cause a lot of problems. And you don't want to kill your bitch just because you didn't go in. Okay, this is my favorite, this is my favorite movie. This is my favorite time at the animal hospital, and this is when we revive puppies. 
And we have a very, like I said, we have a, we have a person per puppy at my hospital. So if we have 14 puppies, we have the receptionist in doing it too. So. And Jim Efron, my ex, Jim Efron, the one who made the PowerPoint for me, um, he uh, is my best puppy reviver. And Andrea Edwards, I mean Andrea, An, um, Andrea Flora is my second best. She's been with, with me since she was 14 years old. She's cleaning the throat out and the nose, getting all the fluids out, and gently rubbing the puppies. Remember, gently. You don't sling puppies. You don't do none of this stuff. That is now referred to as shaken baby syndrome. Sometimes she'll pull them by the neck like mom, just a little tiny bit. He's already crying. He's already crying. He's pink. His color's beautiful. I love seeing him pink like this. But she's very, very gentle with him. You ever use cold water in the face? Cold she's water in the face? Do I ever use cold water in the face? That's <laughs> cold. and I give them injections and they just do injections. If you give calcium, if you supplement it. Not before. No, yeah. we're talking about in labor when the bitch is four hours between puppies. Four hours between puppies, you know what I use? Ice cream. I use vanilla, I, I use vanilla ice cream. What? The mother? I never had a mother ask for ice cream. Be careful you don't give her the whole the whole the whole carton. Be careful you don't give her the whole carton because if you give her the whole carton, she'll ask for the ice cream. But no, I do give them ice cream. I give them natural calcium and um, and energy and, and energy. Sometimes I use Nutrical, caro syrup. Oh, okay. The length of time in between puppies. What is the length of time in between puppies? I don't creep in for three hours. Okay? I like to see my puppies come out every 20 minutes to an hour and a half. Um, I do not get excited if the bitch is not distressed at all for them to take a rest, especially in the middle of delivery. And that's usually when I take them outside for a walk, but make sure to take the towel with you, because you know once they assume the position that they're gonna be having a puppy on the floor. So you just have to be really, really careful with that part. Um, the other thing is, um, um, 
I bring them in and I let them I let them relax and I let them you know I let them just walk around and I, plus I put the puppies on to nurse mm -hmm. yeah. and that causes you know that causes milk letdown plus it also, it causes natural oxytocin to be released. Yeah. So, but I watch my bitches very very carefully. Hi, I'm Nature. We need to get going on this. To spay or not to spay? That is the question. Yes. One quick question. Loudly, please. One quick question with your C-section. We have a bitch that uh, always has sets of twins, so our vet says automatically C-sections all the time because she's had problems where they both will come down at the same time and sort of uh, it will get wedged there. Is that, is that a genetic or is that a false statement? She just, by a fluke, just had two sets of twins? Were they in the same placenta? Yes. yes. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just section him. Okay. You know who has the answer to that question. Just section him. <laughs> and one question on the pie that you're getting started on. Uh, if you have a bitch that is on check drops, is it true that when you take them off, uh, as soon as they come into season to breed them, because they might possibly get high out, or is that a falsehood? I'm into that. All right. <laughs> that. We're going to have to pick up the pace, though. I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. Um, Pyometra treatment. When to spay, to spay or not to spay? If it's an open or a closed pyometra. What that means is, is, is your bitch like four to six weeks out of going, to, going into heat and being bred? And all of a sudden, she's got this green, yellow, orange, purple, yucky discharge coming out of her vulva. She probably has an open pile. Okay. What I usually do is I usually bring her into the hospital, check the under the microscope to see what the little cells look like, and see if she has a an infection. No, no, um, no. They only really talk. So anyway, so anyway. Um, if it's a closed pyometra, it is very dangerous because you don't know, but your bitch will get really, really sick and she can die. She can actually die because there are no external indications that she is in trouble. So what you need to do is you need to look at the time that your bitch was in heat. If you are four to six weeks after that and she's really, really sick, you need to take her into the veterinarian and get her, get her examined. Okay? Diagnosis is with ultrasound, x-rays, clinical signs, blood work, culture sensitivity, and a vaginal smear of the discharge. The vaginal smear will be full of red blood cells, white blood cells, and bacteria. It is a mess. What causes a pyometra not in that time period? Mm. Say it's been six months since she bitch is in season and it's another mm. two months before she's due and she pios? I, I can't tell you. I, you know, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Unless she went into a silent heat that you didn't notice. No. Because your timing's right. Your yeah. timing's right. Repeat that question to the people at first. Yeah, that your timing, your timing sounds right. That that's exactly what happened. That your bitch went into another heat cycle, and that's and you got the pile from it. Four months after the previous one. Yeah, four months is the shortest. Remember? Yeah. Okay, because the bitch is never. I mean, the bitch is two years old. You can't even know when the heat cycles are yet. I would check her out a little more thoroughly. I would check her out, make sure she's not intersex or something like that. I would check her out more thoroughly. We'll talk about it later. Okay. Okay, so anyway, we do an ultrasound. And see this big black thing that's right there? Remember the, the black thing that had a little circle in it before? It was a puppy? That is a pile. That is a pus-filled uterus. It was disgusting. Absolutely, positively disgusting. So what did we do? Did we do surgery and remove it? Did we spay her? No. Okay, next. Well, that isn't a close. <coughs> that was... Well, that was an open pile. Yeah. That was an open pile. But you don't have to spay all uh, closed piles either. So what we did was we gave her cabergoline, which is, which is a prostic, I mean a, uh, a drug that starts to kill the part of the ovary that's producing progesterone. And we also gave her prostaglandins F2 alpha, which remember that name before? Yes. 
He gave it to male, old males to make more sperm. Well, what this does is it actually shuts down the CL, the corpus luteum, which is the part of the ovary that's producing progesterone to keep you pregnant, and it kills it. So what happens is that it throws out all that crap because there is no environment anymore for bacteria to, to form. And that's what happens. It increases the, the contractions and throws all that crap out the back. So that's what happens. And what do you do next? Okay, we've decided not to do the spay, which is the ultimate way of, ta of taking care of a pyometra. What we did instead was we bred with, we treated her with prostate glandus. And I have to tell you, I now send that home too. I have gotten my doses so small with, with, um, with uh, prostaglandins F2 alpha that I can send my dogs home and have the people treat them at home. Yeah, it's, it's much better for the dogs. That's, that was the reason I did it. Okay, what do you do? You breed it the next cycle. You do not leave a bitch like this open. My feelings on this is if you're gonna start breeding bitches, you don't leave them open at all. You breed every season for three to four heats and then you stop. Then you spare her, and if she's not going to be part of your, your household, you find her a good home. She's still young. She's not going to get sick. She's done what she has to do for you. you got her babies. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Okay, so you need to breed her on the next heat cycle. Okay? It's really important that you breed her on the next heat cycle because her uterus has been all geared up. I also pre-treat them with antibiotics on the next heat cycle. I usually use Batril and Clavamox. <laughs> yes, that, exactly, until the bones form. Bones don't start forming until day 42. Okay, birth control, positives, negatives. How many of you have used it? Be honest. Okay. okay. It's so um, hard to get. There's so many free frogs that don't want anything to do with that. We have it. You give me a little jet copter, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, so what, what what is this stuff? It's called mobolarone. It's called check drops. They took it off the market years ago because the weightlifters were using it. All the weightlifters were getting like really bulked up because they were using this stuff. What mobolarone does is it keeps the it keeps the follicles from forming. So if the follicles don't form, you don't go into heat, you don't, have, you, you don't have heat cycles. The natural thing every time you have a heat cycle is to be pregnant. So when we keep our bitches from being pregnant, we are doing unnatural things. So if you are not going to breed your bitch and you want to campaign your bitch, you want to do something like this, there is no reason not to put her on <coughs> check drops, on the bowl run. Yeah. Because it's more dangerous to be off of mobolarone and go through these unpregnant cycles right, than it is to be on. Didn't he greatly reduce the amount you give from when they first started? Yeah. Yes, uh, they have. Is that why there was problems when they first came up with the idea? I think when they first came up with the idea, they just kind of threw it on the market and didn't really do the testing that needed to be done. I, uh, the question is, is why were there so many problems with the drug when it first came out? And I think it's sort of like when, when ivermectin came out and there were so many problems, they just didn't do the testing. I, don't, I think a lot of things have changed as far as that's concerned. Okay, with the amount you're using now, do you get the secondary sex characteristics that we got 10 years ago, 15 years ago? We don't get these, these uh, females that look like males. We do not get those the cheeky, cheeky females. We don't get that anymore. Um, Pardon? The aggression. Oh, we don't get the aggression at all. No. Well, that was a problem when all these guys that were weightlifters that were using it as, uh, an, as an anabolic steroid, they were getting whacked out on the stuff. So they took it off the market completely. But if you are going to leave your bitch open, do not let her go into heat cycle after heat cycle after heat cycle. Okay? Without being bred. If you're not going to breed her, spare her. If you don't want to spare her until she's four years old, put her on check drops. Don't keep her on check drops more than two years. All right, although I can tell you that I've had Nova on check drops for years and years and years, and she delivered 10 puppies, so. Why, why not more than two years? Because it's not proven for more than two years okay. to be safe. Right. And, but I can tell you that I had Nova on 
for a long time, and she delivered 10 puppies, and then I gave her an 11th puppy because I bitch only had one puppy. Yeah. And so if you skip a bitch, you, she's had a litter, you skip a bitch because the timing's not right for you to have puppies, should you be more aware of Kyle? At Absolutely. Time? You have gotten that uterus all ready to, and you know what? The natural thing is to be pregnant every heat cycle. So yeah, you need to watch this very closely. So the effect of the check rocks on the uterus you get from developing um, all those little glandular cells. Yeah. So it's like brand new baby, baby. It's like an infantile uterus. Yes. That's exactly right. So do you read on the first heat cycle then? Oh god no. Okay. Oh god. No. Well, let me tell you why I don't. I'm, I'm real picky. That? The question is, do I do I breed on the first heat cycle? No. Unless the first heat cycle comes after my bitch is two years old. Okay. Because I like to get all my testing in before that. You know, we have a great breed, and it's much better to perpetuate the good parts of our breed. And if you breed her, let's say she comes in heat once a year, you breed her two, three, four and then you want to find her home. She's, she's only four and a half years old. She gets to go spend the rest of her life, you know, as somebody's pet. So that's why I do it, but no, I have to know. Now, I have to tell you, on toy dogs, it's different. Because toy dogs mature out faster, and even though they live a longer time, they mature out faster. Yes? Awesome, Australia. What are the last two breeds? Two breeds, and then they have to be late. Um, I would watch her, bitch. The question is, in Australia, they're allowed to do two, two on, one off, two on. Would I do anything for that one off? Probably not. I probably would just let her, just let her go and see what happens. Okay, and after you take them off of birth control, they can go back in the heat any time from seven days to seven months later. Okay. So don't think you're planting it. <laughs> uh, the other thing, you can plant with obby plant. That's what I was telling you about. You can plant with obby plant. Obby plant is this really neat little thing that you, it comes, you give your, you give your bitch a little, um, she has to be at least four months out of, out of heat. You give her a little bit of um, a local anesthetic into her vulva, and then you have this thing that's, you've done uh, microchips before, right? You got this little thing that goes, it's a little pellet, and it goes right into the vulva. And then you put one stitch over it, and seven days later, you remove it and breed your bitch. Hmm. What are the advantages or disadvantages between obby plant and pervertolin? Obby plant works so well. Obby plant is just like, it's just like, um, the question is obby plant versus pervertolin. Obvio plant works so well, and cabergolin is so darn expensive. Okay, that's probably the biggest thing. Obvio plant is—I mean, you can you can you can like bake your cake by it. It's that predictable. My one repro that swears by cabergolin and doesn't want to do obvio. <laughs> and it's not easy to get. It's not easy to get. What's yeah. cabergolin? Try doing it when you're. It's a it's it's a um, a dopamine agonist. If you really want to know. It's a pill. But this one's so easy. Well, yeah, but no, it's not. But it's not surgical. You put a little drop of Novocaine right in the in the vulva, and you just inject it, come out, put a little suture around it, and then the day that you breed her, you take the suture out, take a wet Q-tip, and take out the rest of the plant. You're doing the suture just to hold it in place. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing the you know, It's not a big thing at all. What's yeah. the cost on that? Uh, it's about four hundred dollars for your obby plant. You're holding out the doors about six. Um, we left eighteen, and we still have to go to forty dollars for the break. Okay, we. Um, I think I'm done. Hang on. Let's see. What's the next one? Say, Devil Provera don't use it because if you ever want to get your bitch pregnant, it'll never happen. Let's see if there's one. Oh, herpes, real fast, herpes. Herpes is a respiratory disease that can also be passed genitally. Um, you really want your bitch to be herpes positive to have been exposed to herpes before she's ever bred. You can find this out by running a blood test. 
Um, the reason you would prefer your herpes, your bitch to be positive to herpes before being bred, and most show dogs are, or dogs that are being campaigned, is if they are positive before and your bitch gets exposed to herpes during pregnancy, especially the last, tri the last trimester, it will protect the puppies from puppy death as well as from um, um, stillborns and abortions. So, and um, primarily passing the respiratory tree, rarely by breeding. Okay, brucellosis. Brucellosis is, is not around very much, but like I said before, it is of public health significance. If you have a dog with brucellosis, you need to contact the public health department. <coughs> you probably will end up cleaning up your entire kennel, if not getting rid of everything that you have. All right, we're there. <laughs> okay. Please fill this out for Dr. Cindy. You have 15 minutes, and we will start. <laughs> 